there's a lot of darkness in this world. That's a, a lowercase d dark, mind you. And there's also the capital D kind, but that's another thing altogether. Now, some people will tell you that it's the big darkness that you gotta watch out for. And in some ways, they'd be right. Could have agreed with them on that a long time before a good friend of mine went and showed me just how far down the crazy rabbit hole goes. Demons, vampires, all that monster madness bullshit. Turns out, it ain't quite as much malarkey as your rational mind would like you to believe. That enormous darkness, well, that's a biblical end-of-the-world type stuff. But the thing about that is, it's obvious, you see. That kind of thing, any number of people will stand up to fight it. It's basic human survival. It's why there's so many damned zombie movie uprising fantasies out there. Everybody wants to grab their shotgun and go get them some sweet hot action. And that's why there ain't no way in hell the world will ever end that way. We'd know that if we'd just pay attention. The society and culture has got any number of references to the little darkness being the one to get you. The world won't end in a bang, but a whimper. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, after all. And my personal favorite, the devil's in the details. This is a story about those details, and that devil. If you're looking for some kind of action movie blockbuster finish, I'd ask you to get off now, because there won't be any of that. Plenty of other places you can go for all that vicarious thrills and heroics you could ever want. I'd encourage you to do so. All you're going to do is be making my point for me. Big evils excite and stimulates the imagination. But people can't be bothered with the little one. It's why it's so damn insidious. Y'all still here? Let's set the stage then. A few years back, I was in a pretty bad way. My only boy Billy had been killed on his way home from basketball practice by a junkie looting to make a quick score. I live outside of Philly, and such things aren't unheard of, though they're a lot less common nowadays, thank God. Anyways, my boy was dead, and his mom and I ended up splitting soon after due to the stress. I managed to get myself fired from my job, and most of my days were spent either crawling out of the bottom of a bottle, or searching around, seeing if I could get a line on his killer. Most of the time, both. Well, one day, I found the bastard. Punk was crashed at a flop house, high out of his mind, sprawled on a mattress stained with dirt and God knows what else. I walked up to my boy's killer and considered him. He was young, only a few years older than Billy probably, jaw covered by a little scraggly yellow beard. He was wearing this stupid knit cap, a whole bunch of striped colors. It's how I knew for sure he was the right guy. That cap was the biggest detail the one witness of my boy's murder could remember. I grabbed the filthy pillow lying next to him and sat it atop his glazed face before pulling out my 45 to finish the deed. I sat there for what felt like forever, but was probably only a minute or two. The barrel of my gun making a depression in the pillow where I was pushing it down against his forehead. It's not like we were the only people in the room. All around me were a bunch of other junkies crashed in various stages of screwed up. But at the same time, it was just him and me in the gun. My hand was shaken from fear, rage, and adrenaline. And there was this little kernel of blackness somewhere inside my chest, just screaming at me to pull the trigger. And somehow, some way, I didn't. I stumbled out of that crack house feeling like a balloon that's had all its air let out. Just totally drained. It ain't that I never killed before. Got plenty of that in a handful of tours in Iraq. But this would have been the first time I committed murder. And brother, if you don't think there's a difference, then you need to spend some more time thinking on it. So, by the grace of God, or just dumb luck, 
I managed to save my soul from the devil for another day. The experience managed to scare me straight. The thought of what I'd almost done and what my life had nearly turned into enough made me want to puke. I vowed then and there that I was going to make a change. Fast forward about 12 months. Ever so gradually, I'd managed to pull my life out of the gutter. I'd cut back significantly on the drinking and thought about going to meetings in the basement of the local church, but ultimately decided against it. I figured I had it under control and really didn't feel like sharing my story just yet. Things kept getting better and better and after a few months, I even got a job as a security guard in this hoity-toity high school down the main line. About that time's when Johnny gave me a call. I was good friends with a guy named Jack, or at least had been back in the day. We'd broken our teeth in the army together and gone through basic and a first deployment in the same unit, thick as thieves. We'd been out of touch for the better part of a decade, but more just because our lives are going to part than we'd had any kind of fallen out. We got assigned to different stations. Jack got out. I stayed in. Life happens, you know? Johnny was Jack's older brother. I'd met him a few times. Enough that if I ran into him, I'd be sure to wave him down. But what were the odds of that? Well, pretty good it turned out. Johnny was in Philly for some kind of conference. Jack knew I lived in the area and told his brother to check up on me on account of Billy. Johnny called and told me we should go grab a drink. I was unenthusiastic, seeing I tended to do my drinking alone as I didn't need anyone egging me on. But what was I going to do? I didn't feel like insulting my friend's brother, even if we hadn't exactly talked for a few years. I told him I had a second shift so I might be a little late, but he said no problem. He'd go ahead of me and get started without me. I finally rolled up to the hotel in my old beater at about half past twelve. Johnny was sitting in the lobby, and he stood up when he saw me walk through the door. Hey, how you been, man? Passing well, Johnny. How's your brother? Good, good. Say, he glanced over at a well-dressed fella sitting next to him. Let me introduce you to Bernard. Bernard was the living Webster definition of Euro trash. Fake tan, stupid short-ass stubble beard, tailored German suit, spoke three languages and could be a pretentious dick in all of them. You know the type. It turns out Johnny had just met Bernard earlier in the evening. The guy was Polish but working for a switch branch of Johnny's company. This conference was his first time in America. And Johnny asked if I'd mind if Bernard would come along for the ride. And grudgingly, I said no problem. It was midnight on a Wednesday, or Thursday I suppose, so we had to drive around for a bit before we found somewhere we could get a beer. The name of the establishment we ended up at was Fireside, though I couldn't tell you why, because there wasn't anything like a fireplace inside. It was a total dive. I'd been in plenty like it in my army days, and just walking in I could tell we should probably think about heading back the way we came. But Johnny was insistent that we wouldn't be able to find a better place, and Bernard figured it'd give him the real American experience he was hoping for. So that was settled. Johnny and Bernard were both already well on their way to a pretty solid headache the next morning from their pregame at the hotel. They picked up right where they left off with Johnny asking the Polacks pretending to be a bartender what kind of micro brews they had. She gave him this look that curdled milk. The only folks in the bar were a handful of local shooting pool on the other side of the room and they were already eyeing us up. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck start to stand up, a feeling I was all too familiar with from my time over in Iraq. Johnny, I seriously think we need to think about going. Ugh, Gabe, come on, one drink? Fine. I nod at the barkeep. Three buds. She gave me something like a smile on a barracuda before setting up three red and white cans in front of us. And so we settled in. 
Johnny and Bernard tried to explain to me exactly what it was their company employed them to do. Johnny told me how Tiffany was pregnant with their second, and he was sure this one would be a boy. I sat there with my beer in front of me, occasionally taking a swallow as I tried to listen. But really, my focus was still held by the four pool players shooting looks at us from across the room. I did some mental math, nodding along with the conversation. I figured I could take two of them, sure, and Johnny could handle the other one. But Bernard couldn't punch his way out of a wet paper bag. I wasn't liking the odds. I started to interrupt Bernard, who was telling us all about his daily workout routine when one of the locals finally decided to make his way over. You foreign? He looked at Bernard, the smell of booze giving away the fact that he was well into it. From my experience, I could tell he was looking for a fight. Bernard's here from Switzerland, Johnny said. Actually, I'm from Poland. Well, she hit. Our new friend grinned maliciously. My wife's half Polish. Hey, asshole. He turned to Johnny. Why are you gonna say he's Swiss if he's a Pollock? You can't go around disrespecting people like that. The booze had slowed Johnny's normally quick wit. Uh, I mean, he works in Switzerland. Nah, it's all right, it's all right. The tough was smiling through his teeth. I gotcha. Hey, Bernard, was it? You want to come out back with me and have a cigarette? Bernard was on his slightly swaying feet immediately. Bernard, buddy, I think we need to get going. You guys have that conference in the morning. He rolled his eyes. Screw the conference. I'm going for a smoke. The local patted my shoulder. Before I could say anything further... They were already out the back door. Johnny was back in his drink, already forgetting the whole thing. Johnny, I asked him, how invested in your new buddy are you? He shot me a quizzical look, because I'm pretty sure he's about to get his ass kicked out back, and I'm of a mind to just walk out on him before they decide to take it out on us too. Okay, really? These guys are harmless. No, they really ain't, Johnny. I'm gonna tell you again. We need to leave. Now grab your stuff, and let's get out of here. I'm just pulling my life together, and the last thing I need is to be getting into bar fights. Let's go find a payphone, and call the cops to come make sure Bernard walks out of here okay. We can do it anonymous, so if I'm wrong, even though I'm not, there won't be any harm done. Johnny got mad then, a drunken kind of anger. Screw off, man. L look, if you want to leave, that's fine. We can make our own way back to the hotel. I was just doing Jack a favor looking in on you anyway. Now, come on. No, oh, damn it, I need this. Another kid on the way? You know the last time I got to go out? Seriously, screw off. I opened my mouth to say something else, but then thought better of it. Words wouldn't change anything. I had work the next day, and damn it, I wasn't going to screw up my teetering hold on a somewhat normal kind of life for a thankless drunk. An ass-kicking would serve Johnny right. I stood up, tossed some bills on the bar, and walked out without a look back even though I still had a bad feeling I couldn't quite shake. You'll remember earlier, I said I'd saved my soul for another day when I didn't sanction Billy's killer. Little did I know, this would be the day. You see, I didn't end up calling the cops after I left. I thought about it, sure, but then decided that, no, there's two of Johnny and Bernard. One of them will be in enough of one piece to help the other one out after their thumpings. And like I said, it'd serve them right. Well, come to find out the next day that I'd be dead on about the ass kicking. Didn't stop with the beating, though. 
The papers said it was a beer bottle across the head that finally killed Johnny. But he'd also been stabbed a dozen times, so who knows? I went into a bit of depression for a while after. Fell off the wagon for a bit. Almost lost my security job, though somehow I didn't. I skipped the funeral. Didn't want to face Jack. He never called me. Don't know if he ever even found out I was there. So what's my point? We tend to think of the devil as some red-faced, horned son of a bitch. And after all I've seen, I'll admit the possibility that something like that maybe even exists. But that's the capital D darkness. The one that anybody would stand up to fight against. In terms of strict definition, Satan is just an adversary, something you struggle against. What if, instead of down in the land of hellfire and brimstone, the devil lives inside every single one of us? What if he's just a little voice, telling you to do things that maybe even make sense, but that you know in your gut are just plain wrong? How would we know to fight? How would we know we haven't already lost? <laughs>